Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Peter Dvorak. I, I think that, that most of you know, know me. And it's my great privilege today to introduce Rudolf Janisch. Rudolf Janisch, Rudy Janisch is a, a professor of biology and at Whitehead Institute, Massachusetts and MIT. And uh, Professor Janisch was, was born in Germany, now it's Poland, as I, as I learn. And because of uh, uh, family tradition, his father and grandfather were, were physicians. He started to study medicine at, the university, at Munich University. And uh, as I learned from many papers and, and, and comments, uh, Rudy Anish was more and more during his studies interested in, in research and he started to work in a, a Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry, if I am right. And uh, then he graduated in 1967 as a, as a MD and and then he left or, or he spent two more years in the Max Planck Institute and then he left to United States to work with, uh, with uh, Arnold Levin in, at Princeton University, world famous genetician. And then uh, he was also working in the Salk Institute where he had, a, he had a, I think, first, first lab. And he started very you know, fruitful collaboration with, with uh, Beatrice Mintz from Philadelphia, finally creating the first transgenic mammals, uh, transgenic mice. And then he re returned back to Germany for seven years because of a nice offer to lead lab there and, and then he moved again to United States to MIT where he was a, he was a founder member of Whitehead Institute and for, for biomedical sciences and, and where is until now. Uh, Rudy Anish got many awards and honors, for example, Robert Koch Prize or Ernst Schering Prize, important Wolf Prize in medicine, and uh, probably the best prize in developmental biology, March of Dimes Prize. He is also a member of, of the USA National Academy of Science. He was uh, for one period uh, president of International Society for Stem Cell Research and, and he, to, to my eyes, Rudy Anish is a major contributor to uh, Yamanaka Nobel Prize for Nobel Prize for for induced pluripotent stem cells. I think the quite important information or thing is that, and this is what I am, I I, I think is is a really great achievement. He's disseminating, he's, a, he's extremely active in training young people and he's disseminating really young scientific start throughout the world and probably you know, some of you know names as a Konrad Hedlinger, really star in, in stem cell research or, or Alex Meissner. I think Kevin Egan was also your student. So. So really, when I am looking throughout the world on all you know important in all important labs dealing with iPS cells, stem cells, regenerative medicine, are former students of of Rudy Anish. and I spent similar as pa as Peter Svoboda last week. I spent a couple of hard hours thinking about what to say about research of Rudy Anish. and then I. I got the idea to show you like, like information also for Rudy that, that his work is really important also for Berno. I, I just would like to show you one, one slide from my lecture for med students, lecture about the stem cells where 
Rudy Ian is the, in my eyes, again, the major achievements are listed. And on the left side, you can see four achieve, important research achievements, and on the right side, side impact on, on the biomedical field. So I think that all work done by Rudy and is, is is quite, you know, have, have, has a great impact on, on applications, mainly on, on medical. Med medical field. So, so that's that's all I can say about Rudy Anish. And finally, we have a one little thing. It's a, it's a tremendous medal for you as a, as a memory for for this for this lecture. So. No, it's turned on. It's better. Okay, is it better? Okay, so he asked me to give a, a brief mentioning of history of science, but I think uh, Peter Oliver told it all. The only thing I can add is I went to medical school and I really hated it. Um, and I got into, um, into um, science, but on the other hand, if you went to medical school, you can't deny it. So you have a different angle. So I decided to change the title of my talk, reflecting this, to really talk about what I think is the, um, which one was, no, there was a, well, maybe this one, um, future of medicine. But I think the technology we are now experiencing, the, 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 the breakthroughs will change medicine profoundly and is already doing so. So I would like to give you a bird's view from what I think is important. Now, having this mental lecture, I think it's probably appropriate to start with the basics. And one of the things I would like to just remind you, obviously, is evolution. Um, when you go to this beautiful museum in, 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 in Paris, but you see this, and in evolution is really, well, you have this enormous progress. We're going up to become now the crown of, of um, in, in, of the world. However, some people believe maybe it's not so going upwards, it goes downwards. So just putting this in perspective. But anyway, genetics. We have uh, 22 pairs of autosomes and they determine what our, our, our size is, large or small, it's genetics, um, six billion base pairs. And of course, um, genetics really incorrect replication can lead to different eye colors, to six digits, to cancer. And what we know is every child, so we know about 5,000 genetic diseases, maybe more, and each of us carries deleterious, quite a number of deleterious genes. Um, they are recessive often, so that's good. But the probability of developing a genetic disease over the lifetime is pretty high. So, well, you all know this, I don't have to go this, but these are over 3 billion base pairs. And if you have a single point mutation, in this, it might lead to some serious diseases or might be silent. Right? So this is just the background. So if you want to study human diseases, I think you, it poses different challenges. So we have two types of monogenetic diseases. In monogenetic diseases, they are rare, they have a clear genetics, and they often have a robust phenotype. They are the preferred type of disease you want to study because you can study it easily. The sporadic late onset diseases, they are common and medically most relevant. They're more relevant than the monogenetic diseases. They don't have a clear genetic basis and they likely have a much more subtle phenotype. So they're much more difficult to study. So I want to keep you 
this in mind because I will come back to this. So there are two key technologies which allow us to approach this, and this is embryonic stem cells and gene editing. So those are the, the two themes I want to, 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 to discuss. Okay, so stem cells. As you know, embryonic development goes after fertilization, through cleavage, you have an embryo, and then you get adult stem cells, which give rise to all your adult tissues, and that is composed of the adult. Now, embryonic stem cells come from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst, and they can give rise in culture to all of these tissues. So I believe embryonic stem cell technology has absolutely revolutionized how we can study development and disease. And just to make the point, this would be a cartoon of a human um, blastocyst. And how you isolate stem cells, you would digest away the outer cell layer with an antibody, and then you expose these cells, which are called the inner cell mass, which form the embryo. You put this into a culture dish, and if things go well, you can induce these cells to divide, to form colonies, and then you can expose these, these cells to various factors, um, cytokines, other factors, and you can use them to differentiate basically to any cell type of the body, to liver cells, to blood cells, to neurons, to um, uh, muscle cells. And of course, this is, um, has enormous potential, as people soon realize, because it allows you um, to potentially study or treat major diseases. And of course, that is the attractiveness of this, of this whole, whole system. OK. So embryonic stem cells. As I said, every, you can in culture make every cell type of the body. And um, this is an attractive system to obtain mechanistic insights into human diseases and to develop therapies. And keep in mind, monogenic versus uh, sporadic diseases and the challenges. So yes cells, the induction of pluripotency and the quest for eternal youth. People think about that, to live forever. Now, this is not a new concept. It actually was 500 years ago. Lukas Kranach already imagined this fountain of youth, where you go in from one side as an old and sick person, you rise on the other side as young and refreshed, and certainly had in mind a pool of stem cells here to do that. <laughs> and this, of course, has gotten into the press now, and people believe that, um, that stem cells are the uh, answer for anything. And of course, if you go to the internet, you can offer for stem cell therapy millions of times. And this is called tourism, stem cell tourism, something very dangerous, because there are things offered which are, have no basis whatsoever. I give you one example, which is from the Swiss clinic, and they offer help with stem cells for anything. Uh, arthrosis, endocrine dysfunctions, impotence, anything. Um, uh, and they're very imaginative because they use um, a Swiss, a rare Swiss apple stem cell serum, which comes from the endangered Uttweiler Spätlaube. Which is, and they, they, they give that. That's really imaginative. Um, of course, you have to pay for this, for the, for the apple serum, and you pay um, um, thousands of dollars. Uh, and if you don't suffer from this, some damage, you're lucky, you just lost, lost your money. So this is a real problem. So the concept of personalized medicine, which is of course very important here, the treatment options are optimal for a specific ailment. In transplantation medicine, that means use your own cells. Right? So that is really the, what, what we want. And so the approach in the 90s was cloning of somatic cells by nuclear transplantation. So this was Dolly. Dolly, the first cloned animal by nuclear transplantation. And what I learned in school was differentiation is a one-way road. What Dolly told us, you can reverse it. You take the nucleus from a differentiated cell, from a skin cell, for example, put it in the egg, and you make an animal. So the conclusion from this was nuclei of differentiated cells maintain the potential to generate an entire organism. 
right? That's the key conclusion from cloning. And when you put the embryonic stem cells and nuclear transfer together, you come to the concept of therapeutic cloning, a big thing in the late 90s. And so the therapeutic cloning, just making the point, if you have an embryo from a sexually produced embryo, you can make from these embryos, you can make therapeutic tissue from stem cells. But if you want to inject this into a patient, it will be rejected because it's genetically different, the problem of, of transplantation medicine. However, when you take the nucleus from the patient and insert it into an egg and make an asexually produced embryo, then you can generate customized therapeutic tissue. And of course, this will be accepted because it's genetically identical. So that is the concept of therapeutic cloning. So in the 90s, this was very controversial for many reasons. The question was, even does it work? And so we did actually an experiment um, a while ago where we took a mouse which had immune deficiency because it was mutate, mutated in this gene, took a skin cell, did nuclear transfer, made an embryonic stem cell, corrected the gene, which was defective, generated now from hematic stem cell, and, and, and really from these cells, hematic stem cell, put them back, and it restored the immune function. So nuclear transfer, therapeutic cloning in mammals works. That was this experiment. But if this is a human, this is just not an option for many reasons. Human eggs are very rare and very controversial to use for this, many, many issues. So the real key issue was, how does the egg accomplish reprogramming? And this, of course, was the birth of IPS cells by Yamanaka. Right? So the IPS egg was really the key issue. And so just to make, you take adult fibroblasts, you add these Yamanaka factors, OCT4, SOX2, MYC, and KLF4, and you get by some drug selection, you get IPS cells. Now, the initial, the initial report from Yamanaka, really they didn't get pluripotent cells. He was on the way. They were not pluripotent. So people really disbelieved it. That was too simple. I must say I believed it because I knew my Yamanaka. And really a year later, three groups, that of Yamanaka, my group, and that of a former student of mine, Konrad of Edinger, on the same day published, yes, you can make pluripotent IPS cells. Nobody could doubt it now anymore. Three labs, can't be wrong. And this led to the explosion in the field. And this was really done very soon afterwards in human cells. So that's the cause of, in 2007, this explosion. So to summarize the IPS approach, this results grow in a culture dish, fibroblasts, you take one, transduce them with these factors, and you get a mouse. It is pretty amazing when you think about it, right? It's converting a cultured cell into a whole animal. That was all IPS. So, so what is it useful for? Well, the concept is very simple. You have a patient, you want to study a certain cell type which is defective, you can reprogram it via IPS cells or by direct transdifferentiation. I'm not going to go into this. And you can generate the desired cell type, which is defective in the patient, and then study it in the culture dish to learn about the disease mechanism. I'm going to give you one example. So this is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a terrible disease, leads to loss of motor neurons, and you can take IPS cells from the patient or from a normal person generate the IPS cells. And then you want to differentiate those to motor neurons and ask the question, do motor neurons from the patient have a phenotype? Let's say they die earlier. And the answer is yes, they do actually. And then you can ask the question, why? Are they similar to what you see in the, in the, in the disease? And they are similar. If you have that, that's very interesting because no, you can ask the question, can you identify small molecules by screening which can interfere with the phenotype you see, let's say early degeneration? So drugs which slow prevent the de degeneration you see in the culture dish. And this is, not, this is not unrealistic. Indeed, people have found compounds which interfere with degeneration. This is the first path to a therapeutic um, and compound. So I think it's, this it tells you how, how successful this is. So when you think about 
the whole system. You have a patient with a severe disease, you make IPS cells, you can make these cells and model the disease and screen. This is the low-hanging fruit of the system. And it's, it is really used in many, many uh, instances. But also you can make these cells for cell therapy for certain diseases. And again, there are the first clinical trials have started for certain diseases. So this is what changing medicine in a major way. So when you think about really modeling some disorder, like a neurological disorder, it requires patient material to generate your iPS cells, which come from the patient, as I explained it to you. So you can make these neurons. One of the problems is, what do you compare it to? What is your control? I said before, it's from a healthy person. That's not a good control, because a healthy person has a totally different genetic background. And what we know is, so that is a big problem, but we know is, a crucial issue is there are unpredictable difference between individual IPS cells because of different genetic background. So if you find a phenotype, the question is, is this phenotype due to what you want to study, to the disease mutation, or to the system immanent IPS, IPSC variation? It's a big issue. And it is, has been ignored by many. And many not very useful um, results came out of this. So one of the solutions would be isogenic controls. We have an identical genetic background, you just differ just at the crucial disease-causing mutation. For monogenetic diseases, that is easy. So the, the idea would be to either correct the mutation in an IPS cell or to introduce the mutation into an ES cell. With the really goal to make isogenic pairs of cells, you can compare apples with apples. Turns out to be crucial. I mean, if you work in most, isogenic S or IPS cells derived from the same embryo or fibroblast. That is a key. Same genetic background. It's the equivalent of inbred mouse strains. Nobody in his right mind working with mouse genetics would use random red mice. No, he was inbred mice to control for genetic variation. It's the same here. So I want to give you one example, Parkinson's. So Parkinson's, we are familiar, monogenetic Parkinson, which is early onset, 100% onset of, of Parkinson's, terrible disease, and we know the genes, but it's rare. And we have sporadic, which is much more important. So give me first an example on this one here, which is an alpha-synuclein mutation. Alpha-synuclein forms these, these what's called Lewy bodies, precipitation in the brain, and they're really seen in Parkinson patients. And we wanted to really model that. We wanted to make isogenic cells. And the, so these are the two mutations, two-point mutations in this nuclear mutation uh, gene, which give you early onset, they're dominant, early onset Parkinson's. So we really tried using, I will later come to gene editing, using gene editing and zinc fingers in this case to um, introduce these mutations. And we could do this with a double strand break introduced by the zinc finger nuclease, um, and we could introduce these point mutations. Now, this was a lot of work. Um, was it useful? Was it worth it? I'll give you two just summaries of that. So we could use these hydrogenic pairs in collaboration with Susan Lindquist's laboratory, who used to be at the White Institute um, before she died. Um, and we, we could see that a neuron which carries this point mutation really has early pathogenetic phenotypes in the culture dish. So that was interesting. But more importantly, then she could screen, as I said before, with ALS for small molecules. And she identified these, this, this ubiquitin ligase, which reverses the phenotype. Now, based on these results, she funded a company which is now doing this in a large scale. So this just shows you the power of looking, using, and monitoring, using the system, basically. And the other uh, collaboration was with Stuart Lipton. And here we found that a cell which carries a mutation is much more susceptible to environmental insults, like pesticides, which play a role in Parkinson's. So you can study this environmental insult um, um, and genetic interaction in the culture dish. But as I said, 
sporadic ones are much more important clinically. Now, sporadic mutation, of course, is the combination of age, genetic susceptibility, and risk factors, environmental. You generally have a positive family history, and really you try to understand the genetics by what's called GVAR studies, genome-wide association studies. You sequence a hell lot of many, many people, right? And so what does it mean? What do you get? Well, if you have Parkinson's, 90% are sporadic. Let's say each of us in this room has risk factors and protective factors, and we are all exposed to different or similar environmental factors, and we are either patients or not. So let's say we have this combination of risk and protective factors, you're a patient. If you have this one, you're not. The point I'm trying to make is there's interaction of many different genetic loci who interact, which give you the final risk outcome. The point is these effects are very small size. And that's a problem of studying those. So how do we study that? And the experimental strategy we are using is using making isogenic pairs of IPS of the different exclusively at one or several risk factors. How do we do that? Well, if you have a control cell, you have candidate risk factors. In general, these are in enhancers. They're not encoding. That's just what people know now. So you have candidate protective factors, and the hands are here to this gene, and let's say this is a potential risk factor, so mutation here to the patient. So how do you study this? Now what you do is using this advanced gene editing, which I will come later to, you exchange those. So basically, you exchange the risk factors, introduce them into the control, or the protective factors, introduce them into the disease gene. Again, with the goal to make isogenic pairs of cells which differ exclusively of what you want to study. That's the key. And we've used this for Parkinson's, for one of the risk factors, and we could really nail it down to the nucleotide why this is a risk factor for late onset, um, um, this point mutation, late onset um, disease because some transcription factor was changed in its binding. And I don't want to go into the details. So environmental factors, and DNA methylation is thought to be protected from this. So this gives you this very simple model here. So we are exposed through our life, throughout life, through physical different exercise, behavioral stress, uh, nutrition, anything. And we are exposed over all life to this. And the outcome is either normal aging, age-related diseases, which could be really associated with hypermethylation or hypomethylation. We'll come later back to methylation. So how do we study that? How do we study genetics, epigenetics, and sporadic diseases? And it's even more complicated. As I said, we carry risk factors and protective factors, and we are all exposed to different environmental insults. But this is not how the whole organism. It might be just restricted to one cell type. So when you think about neurological diseases, you think it's a neuron, but it could be also the glia. Single cell types. Of so that makes it much more difficult. It's a major, major problem. So how do we sort this out? Genetic versus environmental factors. How can we study complex human diseases in the laboratory? What is a good experimental system? And how can we manipulate the human genome and epigenome to correct whatever we think is causative? So basically, is it possible to correct mutations and treat a disease. That's really what I think is the key issue. And the key technology, of course, is gene targeting, editing. So let me come to this. So historically, we could change genes by homologous recombination. In the 80s, um, by Capecchi, Smithies. And so what you have here, homology, you can insert this gene at this position, and by homology, it can be inserted. It works very well, and you can mi make mice out of embryonic stem cells. So it's a rare event. So you have to find the rare cell which has a desired manipulation. You have to select those. You inject them into a blastocyst. You make a chimera. And then you hope that this chimera would, uh, these cells would contribute to the germline. And then you can generate, if you're lucky, um, if successful, you converted a cell growing in the culture to an animal. 
amazing technology, which has been extremely successful in mouse. It, but it's not efficient, you have to select. And it is very time consuming. So such an experiment, if you're good, at least a year. If you're not so good, probably longer. So that's a problem. So when you come now to human, yes, IPS, so the problem is it just doesn't work for reasons which are totally not clear. It's very inefficient. So this is, of course, is the, the emergence of the CRISPR system. So let me come a little bit to the CRISPR system. So CRISPR is really a Cas9 protein which serves as a nuclease and associates with the guide RNA which guides the nuclease to a position where you want, and it produces, that's a key, a defined double-strand break. That's all what CRISPR is about. So the CRISPR system has two components, a guide RNA for homology search, 20 base pairs or so, and the Cas9, which cleaves. These two together is the whole CRISPR system. So it's clear that CRISPR system, again, represents another revolution for biology and medicine. Absolutely clear. So just to make it a little bit more clear, so you have here the Cas9 bound to the, to the guide RNA, and if you don't, if you just use this, what you get a double strand break, which is now repaired, and this involves insertions or deletions. It's impaired by what's called non-homologous end joining. It's a very error-prone process. But if you add a DNA template, which is homology, then it can really precisely integrate at the double strand break by homologous recombination. So the CRISPR can efficiently generate mutation or correct mutations. Simple, that's all what you have to know. It's, it, it's like a molecular scissor. And there is so much potential that even um, Hollywood um, got now involved and they're now having, they're producing now bioterror um, movies which involve CRISPR. Now, how efficient is this really for gene editing in humans or animals? I told you it's efficient, but how efficient is it? So we were wondering about this, and now quite a number of years ago, we asked the question, when you use this, how efficient can you mutate genes? And so the first experiment was to target five different genes, it doesn't matter which genes, with a guide RNA and Cas9, and ask the question, what fraction of the clones you get carry mutations in these genes? And the answer was pretty surprising. 50% of the colonies we got had all five genes mutated in both alleles. Had two genes were Y chromosome, there were only one allele. Enormously efficient. But still, if you were to make a mouse out of this, you had to go through the chimeric approach one year, whatever. So the question was, could you do it directly in the embryo? So for this, we just injected guide RNAs to two of, two of these genes, TET1 and TET2, and Cas9 in the fertilized egg, and made a mouse, two genes target, and asked the question, how many of the pups would be mutated in these two genes? And it turns out 80% of the pups had homozygous mutation in these two genes, 80%. So we, we have interest in these genes for other reasons. We made the same mutation sequentially in the ES cells, one after the other. It took us two years. This took us three weeks. That is the gestation of the most. But still, what you got here was mutations by non-homologous end joining. You couldn't predict what it was, a deletion, insertion, whatever. So could you make it precisely, inserted point mutation? So we did that, injecting the same uh, agent plus an oligo, which contained a single point mutation. And we asked the question, can this point mutation insert it into the two genes? because now we had a DNA template. And the answer is yes. 60% of the pups carried the point mutation in both genes. So this was really, so what I went through this to tell you, it is so efficient, no selection needed, in contrast to embryonic stem cell by homologous recombination approach. And this is the basis of what I'm going to tell you now. It's very efficient. So, CRISPR gene targeting, then you have these components, you put them in a zygote, and you get a 
mouse, and this is very efficient and rapid, really three weeks. And so far, we cannot make the gestation smaller. So we are stuck a little bit with biology here. So the question is, is that useful no, for medicine? Or is it just wishful thinking? So on what level can we think about therapy in humans? Well, somatic therapy. In this case, we would correct the mutation in the patient cells either in vivo or ex vivo. And the consequences of this mutation are only for the patient. And the patient can, of course, give consent to this. It's very important. Germline therapy, you correct correction of disease causing mutation in germ cells, sperm, egg, or the embryo. So in this case, the consequences are for the next generation. So this poses, of course, very, very different issues, not only scientific issues, and I will come to that. So let me first talk about somatic cell therapy. And I give you one, I think, very impressive example, which came recently out. And this is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a very serious disease. It affects one in 5,000 boys, so it's an X-linked gene. Girls are carriers because of X-linked, um, it's an X-linked gene and they have, because of a random inactivation, they have 50% normal cells. Boys, affected boys have only one X, so they're affected. And it's really, it's very serious. You get walking problems, you lose your muscle function, and in general, death is in early adulthood. It's a really terrible disease. It's due to a mutation in the dystrophin gene, which is the largest, largest gene known. It's two million base pairs. It takes a whole day to transcribe such a gene. And it has many, many exons. They're often repetitive, um, AD exons. And most of those are exon deletions or point mutation. It's quite weird. So the function of the protein is it really stabilizes the muscle. It's the transmitter between force generation and the, the extracellular matrix. So it's a big gene, it's a ma major, major interactions. So mice have been made where you delete an exon, and now you see right here, these are the, the muscle which really have dystrophin, they're absent here. And these mice have dysfunction. Their muscle doesn't function well. It's like reflecting what happens in humans. So now comes the experiment. The mutation was in this exon 51, and I think in a very ingenious experiment. Um, people use CRISPR-Cas to cut out the exon, which has a stop codon. And 40, this exon with 52, 49 to 52, stayed in frame. So you just delete the exon with a stop codon, and now you go for, you have a shorter molecule, shorter dystrophin by one exon, but it doesn't matter for function. It's so repetitive, right? So that was the idea, and they're packaged, you know, the, 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 the machinery, the guide RNA in Cas9 into a, a vector, and inject, and this was a vector, and injected this systemically into mice. It's not in the muscle, systemically. And this was all done by Eric Olson, who's at, at Dallas University. And the result, I think, was spectacular. So this is the Newton mouse. And now we inject this systemically. And what you can see now is there's a large restoration of dystrophin function. And indeed, there's also restoration of muscle function. And so this was, I think, a spectacular ex example of in vivo gene correction of a major disease in this animal. And uh, he, they recently published this also in, in some dogs. So I think the this approach, although this we are in the beginning, I think is very promising that we can indeed use gene editing either directly in vivo as done here or in vitro with cells which you can transplant like, like, like uh, hematopoietic stem cells for clinical um, application. So I think it's a very, very interesting approach. So let me switch, come to epigenetics. The other big part, my initial title was an epigenetics, so I have to do something about it. So genetics is change of the sequence, inherited, very clear. Epigenetics is not a change of the sequence, but really is how the genes are expressed by chromatin modification, DNA 
modification, methylation. I will talk about methylation, DNA methylation. It's stable, but in soma, but probably sleep important for variability. And when you think about it, I think epigenetics probably is a key mechanism how the environment talks with our genome. So very simply said, what you ate this morning for breakfast somehow altered in a very subtle way your epigenome. Very subtle, difficult to measure, but it did. So I think that's a way they talk, environment with a gene. Now this has major relevance for diseases, very well established for cancer, but also for neurodegeneration like Alzheimer's, Parkinson, very likely have some basis, imprinting diseases and aging. And key is, it's reversible. And this is being used in cancer therapy to activate tumor suppressor genes which have been silenced by methylation, a very common mechanism in cancer. Now, of course, what people use for this is really cur currently they used unspecific epigenetic modifiers. I mean, many, many HDAC inhibitors, what have you, many of those. And of course, they're unspecific. So they could have serious side effects, and they do. For a cancer patient, that might be acceptable. For a child which has an epigenetic disease, may, may, may not be so. So the question what I'm going to ask now is, can you change the methylation state of specific endogenous loci without side effects, because specific? And I'm talking about methylation. Methylation in CPG is this methyl group on, in the five position of, of, of cytosine in CBG, dinucleotides. And we know DNA methylation really needs to gene silence in concert with histone modification, nucleosome remodeling. So and that's all I want to say about this mechanism. I rather want to come to editing the epigenetic state of specific disease loci without changing the sequence. So this is based, again, on CRISPR technology. But in this case, we don't use a Cas9 white dye protein, but it was called the deactivated DCAS9 protein, which carries a mutation in the nuclease um, function. So this protein, the DCAS9, can still bind to the guide RNA, get guided to a target locus, right? But it doesn't cleave. So we can fuse this protein to either a demethylation um, um, in the modifier, like TET1, just for those who know that, or to a methylation modifier, like DNMT, DNA, methyltransferase domain, to change your target locus. That's the idea. Does it work? If you look carefully at this, and it does work very well. So you can, for example, you have here in this case um, a, a, a gene, a reporter, which is all methylated and not expressed. You can demethylate this by, by targeting TET to it, and you turn on this. And you can also de novo methylate a unmethylated and green promoter and turn it off. Worked very well. You can do it with an endogenous gene like BDNF, important for neural function. So BDNF has a, has a promoter in the exon 4, which is activated upon activating a neuron. It involves demethylation, has been well established. So we can activate this promoter by just targeting the DCAS9, a TET demethylation agent, to this promoter, it turns on the, 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 the gene as well as activity. We can demethylate enhancers, like this is super enhancer upstream of the myoD, myoD gene, and you turn on the myoD gene and lead to, to myogenic conversion from in fibroblasts. And you can, and it's only for the expert, you can target um, CTCF binding sites, which are really important for the for the organization of the nucleus, and you can open loops and turn on genes, like what happens in cancer, for example. And you can do the whole thing in vivo by injecting these things into the brain. So it worked very well. So now the question now is, can we use it for disease? All right? So cancer, as heard before, is one of those, imprinting diseases, or autism syndromes, and that's what I want to talk about. So we're interested in autism, and autism, some of those diseases have an epigenetic basis. So we'll talk about one of those. And this is Fragile X. 
Fragile X is the most common inherited form of intellectual disability in males. One in three and a half thousand, very high frequency. And it's caused by the silencing of the fMR1 gene, an RNA binding protein, which is local, uh, localized on the X. So boys have only one, so they're like, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, they're affected. Females are carriers. Right? They have two, have, half the cells have a normal one, so they are not affected. It's caused by an expansion. It's an expansion disease. So this is the um, start codon of uh, fMR1. In upstream, in this upstream region, a non-translated region, there is normal people have six to 50 repeats of a GGC repeat, a triplet repeat. And in fragile X, this is expanded to more than 200. It occurs somatically in the germ, line, germ cell development. Um, and the, the consequence of this is that the whole locus is shut off. So the majority of the mutation for fragile X are these CGG repeat expansions. And the silence promoter shows heterochromin and Mark said, all methylated, every CBG is methylated. And they have all the histone, um, the, the, the um, uh, oppressive, oppressive marks of, in histone. So there are two strategies we had. Either we target the repeat and ask the question, can we turn on the repeat? the promoter or we can target the promoter which actually doesn't work so we we did that and we, then we can take these ips cells we do it in ips cells we can differentiate the to neurons and to the brain uh, in, in animals so we can ask the question can we turn on so the idea would be to target a cas9 tet to the repeat right and this just shows you this is the repeat 450 repeats in this particular ips cell from this patient this will be the control, 20 repeats. The flanking sequences are identical. So we targeted then a single guide RNA to this and asked the question, would it lead to changes in chromatin structure and in expression? And this just give you one piece of data. This is a repeat, and you can see it's 100% methylated, but if you target the TET in this case, it gets totally demethylated. But maybe more important is a promoter. The promoter in fragile X neurons or IPS cells is fully methylated. These black, black lollipops, are, every CPG is methylated. And when they're white, they're unmethylated. So this is the fragile X. This is a control promoter. And when you target it to the fragile X, you get totally demethylation down to wild type levels. So Targeting the repeat demethylates not only the repeat, but also the upstream promoter. You can ask, so what? What happens about expression? Now, we looked at expression, of course, and this just shows you this would be the expression in Y-type cells, this would be in fragile X cells, and this would be after we target those. Basically, we get expression to, the, to a similar level in, 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 um, in, uh, after editing. Of course, this is in principle reversible. So let me summarize what I told you here about the fragile X. So targeting the repeat with this Cas9 TET fusion induces demethylation of the repeat and the upstream promoter. It reactivates the fMR1 gene in yes cells and post neurons. You can do it transiently, it's stable. And most importantly, um, and, 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 it, and it stays stable after you transplant it to the brain. And most importantly, it rescues the mutant phenotype in postmitotic fragile X neurons. So fragile X neurons are known to be hyperactive electrophysiologically, right? And it really reduces to wild type level. So it's clearly a potential therapeutic approach, which brings me to the problems. Is it a therapeutic? What do we have to solve? What are the ch challenges? So I just list those which come to mind. So you have to know for each of these diseases, what do you want to target? And I can tell you, this is not that easy. For other autism um, disease we are studying, for Rett syndrome, the issues are very different, right? I think a key one is what fraction of cells need to be edited 
for achieving a therapeutic effect. That's very important. And it's connected to how efficient is a gene transfer into the brain. So these are two technologies. You need first to understand the biology to correcting it, and then you have to give, get these modifiers into the brain. And that is a total, that's a vectorology, very important. Now there's enormous progress in people developing vectors. So I think these two together will solve that. But of course the key issue is still, is the disease condition reversible? or is it developmentally set? If this is a developmental disease, you're born and that's it. If it's irreversible, therapy won't help. For fragile X, that's not known. The right experiment hasn't been done. But for Rett syndrome, it's another extinct autism syndrome we are very interested in. If you have made mice, that has been established. In Rett syndrome, clinicians thought it's a terrible disease, I don't want to go into details. Clinicians have said it's a neurodevelopmental disease. We made the most, the most model for this. The most model taught us, no, you can reverse it transgenically. You can turn on the gene, even the most moribund, or about to die, you rescue it. That was a very important result because it argued it's not a developmental disease mainly. It's a maintenance issue which of course led to therapeutic um, approaches now and that's ongoing. So I think it's very, um, it's a different type of disease. So, but this remains a key issue. So let me come to the final part, namely the application of genomic engineering generally. So what is it really used for? Well, we can make now, of course, human yesters, I showed you this. We can make now monkeys, which have precise mutations of human um, diseases, which of course is better than mice. Um, we think it is really now targeted gene therapy, which is now for therapy in vivo gene, genome editing. I showed you the example of Duchenne, or combined with cell therapy for bone marrow diseases. And sickle cell anemia would be one which goes to clinical trials. Now, you correct the sickle cell mutation in bone marrow stem cells because it's so efficient with CRISPR, you can do that. But the question I want to come to is should we use it to modify the human germline? Should we use it on human embryos? Right, so that's the major part of discussion. So why do you want to do that? So this to remind you, it is so efficient, you put it into the, these, these components, into the um, fertilized egg, you don't need any selection, so that's why you can do it in the egg, and it's rapid, in mice it will be three weeks. Right? So should we use this to modify the human germline? And the question is, why would you like to do that? And again, let me remind you, somatic therapy I talked about when we talk about germline therapy. Correction of disease causing mutation in germ cells, consequences for the next generation. That poses a lot of questions. So why, you, why do you want to do that? So I think people think about correction of disease causing mutation. And you can think of many terrible mutations or inactivation of the susceptibility gene or expression of protective genes to achieve disease resistance. That's not treatment. It makes a different a person is resistant or for enhancement. So this is a spectrum of people, what people think about. So let me talk first about the scientific issues here. It's easy, much easier. Yeah, but concrete. So the scientific issue would be, let me go for correcting a disease causing mutation. I think complicating issues are genotyping of embryos. So let's assume you have a Huntington's disease, an expansion disease, a terrible disease, no therapy possible. It's, it's, it's really awful. But if you make embryos from this, you will have 50% of the embryos, the dominant disease, will be wild type. 50% will be mutant. If you have a recessive disease, 75% of embryos will be normal. There's no way, and I mean there's no way, there can't be any proof, to genotype mutant versus wild type embryo because there's one DNA and you want to modify that so you can't use it for diagnosis. So this tells you you can't distinguish mutant and normal embryos. Therefore, you will, whatever you do to these embryos, will alter genes in 50 or 75% of normal embryos. 
I believe there's a big problem in doing this. For me, this is, I think we shouldn't, can't do this easily. So that's a, a complicated issue. Disease resistant inactivation. So what are the genes? For example, you could inactivate the HIV receptor. So you would get a human who is resistant to HIV. This is used in the clinic, doing it in bone marrow cells. Or correcting of this PCSK9 mutation in liver to reduce LDL, which protects against heart disease. Could do this so proactively. But you have to think about it. The alternative, of course, is you can manipulate blood and liver cells in the patient itself postnatally, right? And the patient can give consent. So you don't need really um, um, germline um, um, manipulations to do that. And finally, enhancement. An example would be insert the growth hormone gene into an expression locus. Very straightforward. It will work. Absolutely, we get, um, you will of course get increased height, but enhancement of course poses many diff much different um, issues other than scientific. So let me come to the non-scientific issues, right? So, um, but before I do that, the principal scientific problem is that what I talked about is, um, is manipulation at fertilization, which is coincident with intracytoplasmic sperm injection, ICSI, on zygotes, by but I showed you from mice, um, doing this, in injecting the, the, the components, you know, the ones fertilized egg. The problem is, with all of these approaches, the success of the manipulation cannot be assessed for many reasons. And there are many reasons because mosaicism, whatever. And of course, even if CRISPR is so efficient, it's not 100%. So you cannot assess whether you're successful or not when you make a baby which might have a defect which you don't want. Is there a way out of this? And it is. If you do it postnatally. Postnatally, you can't, you don't have a zygote to do it, but you have germ cells. Spermodigonial or even oocyte stem cells. In this case, the advantage would be the cells can be cloned and checked for correct manipulation. So I'll give you an example. And this is here, it's from Ralph Brinster. In the 90s, he showed you can isolate spermatogony stem cells from the testes and key. You can culture those cells, you can clone them, you can inject them back into the testes and they can give rise to mice, they can fertilize. The key is, since you can clone these cells, that's the opportunity for gene therapy. You can put this, do this in like any other cells. You make clones, sibling clones, you sequence everything you want and really um, ascertain you did the right manipulation. This would solve, in principle, the um, scientific issues. And now you can probably do this also for the female germline. You can make oocytes from IPS cells, so therefore you can clone and, and, and check the IPS cells. So there's a lot of... Um, um, progress. So the use of spermatogonial or oocyte stem cells may resolve most of the scientific issues I talked about. So now comes the ethical issues. Should we do it? Right. So that's of course much more complicated. It's not a scientific issue anymore, but anyway, I think we have to really think about it. So what are the worries? Ethical worries are mistargeting causes uncertain or unwanted problems. People argue, respect of eugenics. <clears throat> Is it really a slippery slope to eugenics? And once introduced, it may not be possible to reverse the alterations, right? So these are the, the issues you have to consider. And editing, if this becomes a method, may really make it even more pronounced, inequality, because it will be very expensive. Right? Some people can afford it, others not. So arguments against German manipulation would be intergenerational consent is not feasible. You cannot ask the egg to agree what's done to it. It's impossible to predict consequences and it's a threat to human dignity. I just list some of the arguments people in this very um, a lively discussion is ongoing. Counter-arguments would be intergenerational concept 
not relevant for multiple is not relevant for multi multiple other decisions regarding future generations. We don't ask our future generations how they have to deal with climate change. We do it, right? And there are many, many examples. It's impossible to predict consequences for other well-intentional efforts to improve the human conditions. And again, you will have many, many examples for this. And there is no shared conception regarding the notion of human dignity. So you see the spectrum of arguments going here. So the National Academy of Sciences um, convened two years ago a committee to work out really guidelines under which, or which, under which one should or should not consider germline ma manipulation, somatic manipulation and germline manipulation. I was part of this committee, and I give you some of the key conclusions here. So the committee came to the conclusion, really should be very cautious in considering this under very stringent um, criteria, um, but they didn't want to totally close the door. So these are some of the um, issues would be, so the absence of any alternative, I'm giving some examples later, Restrict, uh, restriction to editing genes that have been convincingly demonstrated to really have a disease relevance. Availability of clear, credible, good data, clinical and preclinical, to do that. Maximum transparency, you really want to be sure that everybody can see this, and really oversight, very stringent oversight. So these are the, the issues which we do. So where, where are we now when we think about in this discussion? Right? And I'm not going to give you an answer, because I don't have an answer, I have an opinion. Um, so it's my last slide. So why do we want to do this? Disease prevention, hunting disease, taste sex, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, all those are terrible mutations. Could we get rid of this in the next generation, right, by this? And you could argue for or against it. I gave you my arguments against it, right, because you, you would uh, do it in embryos, but this all goes away if you do it with spermatogonial stem cells. You can do that, right? There you, the scientific arguments fade. I mean, you have to keep this in mind. Alternatives would be, of course, pre-implantation pre in genetic diagnosis or somatic therapy. For many of those, you can do it somatically. It's been shown, so we don't need germline modification. But there are some where there's no alternative. For example, if a, um, a male or female is homozygous for the Huntington's mutation, they can have only affected children. There's no way out. Or if both parents are homozygous for something, there's no way out. pre diagnosis wouldn't help. Or if you, for example, infertility caused by a Y chromosome defect, this male could not have children. Right? So there are certain scenarios where there's no alternative. So would this be justifying it? Well, that's the question which everybody can think about. Modifying disease risk, I talked about HIV resistance, knocking out this receptor, or heart disease by uh, knocking out this gene, Alzheimer's disease, should you eliminate APOE-A4, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's, right? Would it be nice to get rid of this allele? It's point mutation, getting with a protective one, or for cancer like BRCA1 or BRCA2. Enhancement. Can we use it to make more muscular, better sports, um, 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 sportsmen, eye color, learning and memory, or complex traits like, of course, these are the most challenging one. So this is a spectrum that we have. And the real question is, and that's what I think we have to think about and discuss, what is permissible and where is where's the, the, the edge? And I think, I don't have an answer for this, but I think that's where I see where the discussion has to go. Okay, so this was my last slide. I will give at least credit to some of the people who, who contributed to what I talked about is, and these are like Frank Salton, a long-term co-worker for me, who did all the Parkinson experiments, Sean Liu, all the epigenetic editing, how we among, and they're both in China, no back, no have, have positions here. They did all the CRISPR um, um, modification in mice. So, thank you very much for your attention.
many thanks for a great talk, and, and now please ask questions. Beautiful lecture, thank you. Uh, I was wondering, so for this uh, targeted epigenetic changes, did you try to look how permanent they are? So is there a chance that actually the environment will cause the hypermethylation again, or? So that's, so the question is really what, I, I understand it, what are the, I guess what the environment does to certain genes? This is one of the key questions we have, and I didn't really talk about this, but I think that's one. So what happens when you, so in cancer we know it sort of. Your diet can affect methylation of tumor suppressor genes. You see it, it's relatively easy to study because it's a clonal disease. For Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, if there's an epigenetic basis, every neuron will be differently affected. So you can't do it with the overall by so far sequence. You get an average and you're going to lose it. And people do this, but I'm not sure how, how informative that will be. So you have to do it on a single cell level. And we do this now, we have built a reporter where you can look at single cell resolution with a GFP reporter in real time for changes in methylation of a given gene. We're just doing this now to exactly ask that question because I think that's at the key, at the heart, in my opinion, of environmental influences or aging or genetic predisposition on epigenetic, because every neuron will be affected differently. So you have to, so that's it, I, it's of great interest to me to, to, to uh, and if I would have used my other title, I would have talked about that part. <laughs> okay. Very nice talk. I was just wondering for, um, for this CRISPR-Cas9, what's the off-target rate? <laughs> You would put the finger on a really key issue. So when I talked about targeting the repeat, GGC, this is not a unique sequence. <laughs> so when we experimentally, that's getting a little special, but there were 1,000 off-target sites, 1,000, by, uh, by just informatics. So we asked the question, where, and indeed, Cas9 binds to about six, depending on how much you put in, 1,600 target sites. So what's the consequence? The consequence is really interesting. Most of the genes don't change anything, but 29 genes change methylation to a certain extent, more than 10%. FMR was of totally demethylated. So then we asked the question, what is the consequence for expression of these 29 genes? And you have to, of course, realize the methylated gene is not expressed or very low. And the most we saw was a fourfold expression of some genes. So fourfold expression over zero or very little. So we looked at this and we couldn't see anything, but this is a key issue. So we believe it was minor, but it's a very important issue. So the key is, can you do it? Can you target a unique sequence? And the promoter, which was the method of the key, is unique. When we target that one, we got the first big failure. We could not demethylate it when the repeat was methylated. So clearly we don't understand the rules at this point. So you have to target something else to this promoter, maybe uh, affecting histone um, modification. We're doing that. So the key is we want to understand how to manipulate. I think this is part of the answer, com com long answer on your simple question. The off-target rate in this case was an issue. We addressed that very carefully. And um, we have to deal with that. Okay, next questions. If, 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 can I, ah, somewhere. Can you give us a figure of uh, how much it costs to clone the genes that come from the USP? Say, say it again. The total of the cost of this technology would be eventually going to be the next big thing. Well, a lot. <laughs> um, so the question really is, depending on what you want to do. I mean, if you think about cell therapy using IPS cells, these things are done now as a proof of concept, right? And has been done for macular degeneration, has been published, and will be done for Parkinson's. Using IPS cells will be prohibitive because it's so expensive to make them. So the approach here would be to make off-the-shelf IPS cells by using, and Yamanaka is really promoting this a lot, would be to um, select HLA homozygotes and make iPS cells. So an HLA homozygote is a much better donor than 
and you're HLA um, and diverse, right, and, and heterozygous. And so the estimate is you need something like 30 or 35 IPS cells if they're homozygous for, for the common HLA types. You can, there could be donors for 85% of the Japanese population off the shelf. That's a solution. For the rest, for the final 15%, you need 20,000 IPS cells because it's getting very rare, these rare alleles, right? So this is one approach which might then make this to a clinical um, 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 approach. To do gene therapy, many things have to be resolved, right? So I don't think it will be cheap, but I have no idea what it eventually would cost. But clearly this is a very important consideration if you think about clinical um, implementation. I have one rather personal question. We both were on the meeting, I think it was in Toronto, ISSCR meeting, where Shinya Yamanaka presented his achievements. Mm -hmm. And my feeling in the time was that you are the only person sitting in the lecture hall that believe that it's true. Yeah, yeah. It was just a feeling or you had some No, some I think we were, we were thinking very much along the lines of Yamanaka, yeah. right, and he beat us. So, so I think, no, I believed them immediately. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was very exciting. Of course, he, he, he had this gene X, right? You remember that? He didn't <laughs> reveal the four genes. One, one gene he didn't reveal was gene X. So, so um, yeah, no, I believed immediately. And then I have more ethical question uh, for the last slide. So do, do you personally believe that we can stop human beings from uh, this sort of uh, improving, you know, attempts using editing? You propose some rules yeah. which might be valid and eventually, so, right. you know, because I, I would like to know your opinion. You mentioned that people do travel somewhere to get some stem cell or pseudo stem cell therapy. So likely if anybody will offer you that you will get a super healthy, super intelligent child, if you just pay somewhere in the Pacific Island, if it's not under the water at the time, then uh, yeah. do you think one can stop that? I agree. I mean, this is of course <clears throat> an interesting issue. We can talk a lot about this, right? When you think about um, this technology, which will be available to those people who have the means to pay for it, which is, of course, a certain class of people, um, would they use it to change their advantage over others who have not these means? I mean, you can go more, more trivially, who gets a good education? Those who have money, at least in the States, right? Um, so you have this advantage anyway. But this is more serious, what you're bringing up, and I think, indeed, this will be driven if it's really shown to, to improve your chances to compete. And would it make a different class of people, right? I mean, you come back to the, uh, the uh, incredible foresight people like Huxley had, right? You make different classes, genetically different classes. I can go on and on and speculate how you would do that. Um, I think it's a real, a real, if that becomes efficient enough, I believe it will be used. So the, 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 the issue I think is we have to, we have scientists, have to make the public aware these are consequences which can come out of this type of research. Yes. And society has to decide, do we want this or not? Can we permit this or not? Do we want this? Some people argue, transhumans, they're called transhumans, they argue, there's no way we have to do this in order to survive. We have to make better humans. Humans which maybe need less oxygen and can go on space travel and don't need whatever, right? All there are different opinions. There are as many opinions as people, right? So I, I don't have an answer to this, but I believe it's a real, it's a real possibility what you're raising. Uh, yeah, thanks for a nice talk. I just wanted to ask one technical issue. Uh, if I understand it right, you mentioned that methylation is kind of reversible change, so how you stabilize it? 
because how do you what stabilize it i mean like you okay. change methylation how you prevent for it so we, we looked at this in the fragile x case yeah. By, so initial experiments were all done with lentivirus, so where always expression of Cas9 and the guide RNA. But then we asked the question, when you turn off Cas9, would it be stable, right? And it was. So it was stable at least for three weeks in dividing cells as well as in, in, in postpantotic neurons. So for this locus, we know you need transiently activators and then it's stable. For other loci, it may not be the case. We don't know. It might need to be stabilized otherwise. So it's again a question which is depending on the on the target locus. You you you, you just you kind of it. repetitive injections or something like. Sorry. Uh, just like maybe like repetitive injections if it will. Well, be. or you 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 continue to express it. The lentivirus you get yeah. constitutive expression. Is that good for the cell to get Cas9 all the time? I guess we don't know, right? We don't know that. It seems from for most experiments the mice don't mind, but that might be too crude an essay. After all, it's a nuclease, and you can't predict what nuclei all can do, right? And with a certain frequency, so that's. Um... Okay, some more questions. Groundbreaking or quick? Okay, if not, thank you again, really. <laughs>